We, we take all this analysis and we encode it in the computer tools that we build for our artists to use. So when the artists are working with this material, they just give us the, those digitized points or you know, the equivalent of this four-point polygon and a curve appears. And they don't really understand how it happens. Um, they gain some intuition for how the curve is related to the polygon, but all that eigen analysis and magic numbers, that's all buried inside the, the software. So we try to give the artists artist-friendly tools so that they can not have to worry about um, you know, all the math and the numerical analysis under the hood. Um, so when we've done our job well, the artists you know, really don't know a lot about the, the math and physics underneath. They're, they're using the tools at a creative storytelling level. The images that you see in the theater result from doing a simulation of how light bounces around in our virtual environments. And the way light bounces around in our virtual environments is very physically inspired. So we look to physics for the equations that govern how light is transported. And then we write computer tools that determine how light is going to bounce around ultimately to the virtual camera. And what that virtual camera sees is what you see in the theater. Another example is how clothing and hair moves on our characters. Our animators don't want to create all that motion of the clothing themselves. They want to create the motion for the characters because that's where the acting comes from. And then we have to write computer simulation that, again, is based on things like differential calculus, for instance, that describe how the cloth is going to move in response to the body motion. We do water simulation. We do smoke simulation. We do flesh simulation. And again, all that is governed by physics equations and numerical analysis, computer geometry. <laughs> is there an end game for you guys, or are you guys always going to be in a job? Well, it's hard to see the end game. Uh, we know a lot more than we did 20 years ago when I started here, but there are still some big mysteries out there. Uh, one of the biggest ones is these you know, flesh simulations and cloth simulations we do are really slow. And so our animators don't see the result of those simulations until much later, we'd like to get to the point where the animators are seeing the full performance, including the cloth and the flesh, in real time. And we're many orders of magnitude and computational speed away from that right now. So that's we're putting a lot of energy into that problem. Is there a holy grail in animation, or is there a well-known biggest problem in animation world where, like, you know, Whoever cracks this one is going to make a big leap forward in that side of things? Well, for a long time in computer graphics, there was the holy grail of creating what was called a photorealistic image. That is, an image that's indistinguishable from a photograph. And we reached photorealism, oh, you know, five, eight years ago, something like that. There's another holy grail for many in the computer graphics industry, which is to uh, create a photorealistic human. And we're just now approaching the ability to create digital actors that are indistinguishable from real actors. That's not something that, that Pixar is so interested in. Uh, we, we like telling stories in a very stylized way, um, you know, kind of glorified cartoons in a sense. But lots of others in the industry, like in visual effects houses, like Industrial Light and Magic, uh, photorealism is a very important milestone for them. You know, for us, physics is kind of a starting point, and physics is nice because a lot of the audience's intuition about how things move is, is you know, largely driven by physics. But our directors you know, really want to you know, exaggerate uh, oftentimes uh, and, and stylize, as we talked about earlier. And the, the frontier of stylized looks is vast. Photorealism is just one little tiny point, so that's really exciting for us. There's lots of things you can't talk about, but you do publish papers. What do you publish papers about? What's your kind of threshold and reason for publishing papers? Where's the thinking there? We have taken the philosophy that we'll publish anything that we are proud of and, is feel, and feel is publishable. And there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one is that um, exposing ourselves to the discipline of publication and peer review makes our work better because other people are reading it and, and, and carefully critiquing it. Uh, another reason is that uh, it's a good recruiting tool. 
um, scientists know that they can come here and uh, you know continue to participate in the academic world. They're not going to disappear from the research world if if they join us. They're really nice looking academic papers, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess you've got a bit of help, but quite a few people at Pixar, you know, co-author papers. So you'll see you know dozens and dozens of, of authors on our website. One was a new hair simulation system for Merida's hair in Brave. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of work to increase the the warmth of the lighting in effects that you see in our films, and that's called global illumination, and you'll see a number of papers that folks here at Pixar have written on global illumination. There have been a few new kinds of geometry and geometric modeling papers that we've written recently, so it's a, it's basically covers every discipline that we work on here at Pixar. What's it like for you watching an animated film, a Pixar film even, like when you go along to one? Do you, do, you, do you see them for what they are, or is it like the Matrix and you're just seeing a series of numbers and equations? And well, films that I've worked closely on, I, it's hard to watch and not see all the flaws. And uh, so I've, what I've lately started doing is I don't want to see anything about the imagery in a film, say, nine months away from its release. And that way I can go to the theater and enjoy it with fresh eyes just like the, the rest of the theater goers. And then I just enjoy it like anybody else. What about when you watch other animated films from, from that you've had no involvement in? Do you unpick things in your head and think about the math behind it, or is it not like that? Uh, it goes in fits and starts. There are some periods where I'm just caught up in their story, and there are some periods where I go, oh, wow, I wonder how they did that. And I try not to do that, but it's, it's really hard. So the camera really never moves. All we're doing is applying a transformation that appears to move everything relative to the camera. There are some magic numbers involved. <laughs> so let's get a sense of what those numbers are. One pair of magic numbers are, are one, one here. Those are the weights that I used in this averaging step when I moved things to midpoints. 